Hello, people. I can see some people in the chat room now. So I'm not alone anymore, I guess. I'm hoping you guys can see my setup here. And I have my tablet with me to watch the live chat. So I can see it when somebody has a question or wants to say something. So hello, good morning. For me, it's good morning. I don't know where you are in the world, but for me, it's good morning. So I, I am going to try and adjust my camera position just a little bit more. Yeah. And um, I'm ready to start. Um, there is an, e an enormous lag between what I'm recording and um, the live broadcast. Um, I think it's about half a minute, so that's a lot for me. So if you have questions, then um, it might... <laughs> Um, there might be some confusion about when you ask. So, hello, you live in the USA. Do you have insomnia so you can watch tonight? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I am. Um, I did sleep over here. It's morning and I am not yet really awake. <laughs> so I feel rather sleepy. So maybe my sleepiness um, can infect you a little bit. <laughs> so that after the video or somewhere along... In the video, you may um, find some sleep. Okay, so I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to do this um, painting today. Um, it's a painting of a woman seeking shelter in nature. Um, she is caressed or embraced by a tree, and she herself holds um, a woodpecker. Why a woodpecker? Um, because in my life, there are a couple of woodpeckers. Um, I live at the edge of town and right outside my window is a chestnut tree. It's about 20 meters away from here. And in the top of their chestnut tree, there's very often a green woodpecker. So, um, yeah, she, she comes back. She keeps coming back in my work more and more. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, first thing I'm going to do, though, is um, I'm going to ink her. And the reason I sketched this drawing with red pencil is that I want to ink her with red um, micron pen um, instead of with black because um, I've seen it on Instagram a couple of times and I really love how um, the mood of the painting changes when you use red ink. And I never did that, so I ordered a couple of micron pens and... Um, to do this and I also ordered um, erasable um, color pencils um, these by Faber-Castell um, because when you do sketches um, you want to after inking you want to erase a thing or two at least I do I think I do <laughs> maybe I don't maybe it's more beautiful to, to leave it as it is so first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, 
ink. So I'm going to give myself a little bit of space and there is such a lag in the video. So I hope that at all times I'm keeping the drawing um, um, visible for you in this, this area the, because it takes about half a minute before I can see on screen how everything, um, you know, before I can see what I record on screen. So I'm just going to start. And this is always quite scary because I never, ever ink first thing in the morning um, because my hands are still sleepy. My muscles are not yet awake. So what I sometimes do is that I just um, grab a piece of paper that I um, try to wake up my hands with, so to speak. You hear something in the background that's a motorcycle is one of my neighbors going to work. There is not a lot of difference in thickness between these um, between these lines. So I'm going to try and get, you know, a crisp line and I can feel my hands are shaking. So couple of weeks ago I um, inked a very graphic and very um, stylized drawing and I did that with very shaky hands so that was rather stressful well and a sip of my morning of my morning um, tea.
So with my um, not yet awake hand, I'm trying to ink. <laughs> I'm not, you know, that's on a Monday morning, first thing in the morning, that's always a little bit tricky. My muscles aren't yet obeying me the way I want to. Hello, Rhiannon. Is that your real name, Rhiannon? I love that name. Um, there was a little something. I, I also tried uh, um, yesterday, no, last night when I went, before I went to bed, I made plans about how I was going to ink this. <laughs> and I'm trying to remember. <laughs> so I hope you guys can still see me, but I find it easier to work um, vertically than horizontally so I am flipping my um, my canvas so these are branches so I'm trying to draw them in a uh, with a lighter touch of my hand Oh, Rhiannon, that's your real name? Great. <laughs> oh, I bet everybody asks you if your parents were Fleetwood Mac fans, I think. So I won't. I won't ask you. <laughs> I was named after a song by um, a Dutch singer. So um, I am always, I was always asked. Not anymore because I think people... I've forgotten about this singer by now, but, um, yeah, I don't, or, yeah, there was, at the time there was a hit by Barry Mandilo, Barry Mandilo, oh Mandy, um, and at the same time there was a Dutch singer who saw, who sang, who had a little hit with, um, a song named Mandy, so all my life I've been asked whether my parents <laughs> were a fan of either one of those singers. Which they were. So I have no experience with, um, this is the first time I'm using these um, red micron pens. So I am a little, um, I am about to go over these lines, but I just inked this one. That wasn't, a, that was a bit clumsy of me to do. You see, this is a Monday morning. Normally I would never ever ink a line that I would have to draw over, 
go over that with my hand. I'm not sure what the smudge factor of this of these are is are. <laughs> I'm not really awake, guys. <laughs> hmm. I need to give it some time, I think. Yeah, a couple of seconds should do. Hmm. Okay, so fingers crossed. Oh, and my muscles are not yet awake and I'm trying to make a slick line. <laughs> it's not easy. Uh, you know that, yeah. I can't imagine. Okay, so turning the page again. And now I need a little help. And I got a little help from a, an old book that I bought and that helps support my hand because I'm working on a, on a block of paper. Enya, hi Enya. First time on my live stream. Okay, good. Good to see you, Enya. Welcome. <laughs> it's been a long time since I was here. So um, for me, this sort of feels like a first time. Um, <laughs> although going live is always a little bit exciting. Because, you know, you don't want to screw up life. <laughs> Although, what is the screw up, right? I mean, it's just happy accidents. Okay. Um, I think I should do something else before I continue with this one. I'm going to move on to the micron point, um, the micro zero one, micron, sorry. Hold on. What I want, I got to do what I needed to do first, or else I'm going to forget. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is sort of like her dress or her coat. And there is um, um, branches, branches going up on that, um, on her coat or her dress. And um, I want it to... Oh, damn, I forgot something. Oh, God, it really is a Monday. <laughs> You're going to see me do mistakes. <laughs> um, anyway, I wanted to leave this open. So at the bottom here, I wanted to leave the um, the jacket, the, the coat open. So as to create more of a connection um, between her clothing and her person, her character, um, and connect it with, connect her with nature. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> if I close her, her jacket, then, um, then she's not integrated with nature. So that's why I am leaving it open because this drawing for me is all about um, the connection with nature. I really don't like this line. I made a mistake there. I don't like them. Good night, Rhiannon. <laughs> Good night. Right. So... very hard to talk and to draw at once.
Now I'm beginning to get the hang of it again, fortunately. It's just that I can feel my muscles aren't yet awake. So um, and what I'm painting now is an experiment with um, red ink. And I know that inking first thing on a Monday morning is not what I normally do. Normally, I would like to have really steady hands, so my muscles have to be awake before I ink. But I really wanted to do this and I wanted to go live. So I thought, you know, just going to give this a try. Let's see how it goes. What sometimes happens when um, my hands are not yet awake is that um, when I try to be very precise in drawing, Sometimes suddenly one of my hands just, you know, shoots over the paper. And that's really annoying when it happens, but it happens. And, you know, I have to count. I have to take that into account. And not be too upset when it does. We're just with very few this morning. The line across the branch makes it look like an intended volume outline, like the branch separate from a little bit behind. Yeah. Yes, you can see it like that. So I'm not too upset. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Thank you. Sometimes drawing is all about, you know, realizing our expectations, right? And we don't always do that. And I can always tell when, you know, when there's been a holiday. There was a holiday now. You know, the a holiday in the sense of a break. So I had my family home and I never draw and paint a lot when they are home. You know, when, when there is a full house, it's just, I need to sort of be like, well, it sounds a bit, um, maybe it sounds a bit, um, I don't know, I don't know how you call that, but it's like I need to sort of work in the zone, like have my, um, the space has to be all mine. And sometimes it's hard when when people are at home. It's not that I don't like having them home. It's more that, you know, when there are people sort of like invading my private space. Well, that's not a really nice thing to say, but I think you know what I mean. When you're used to working alone, um, you get used to it. What I find um, when I draw with red lines, what I find really strange is that when you draw with red line, with red ink, um, there is more a sense of volume. Now with the red lines, because they are so, red is such an obtrusive color, um, I'm experiencing that um, I find them all very, they're all just lines. I need to get used to this. So I'm not really seeing shapes, I'm seeing lines. So that's weird. <laughs> I wasn't really expecting that. I can always say it's Monday morning. <laughs> Mm. Now let's let's do this first. <coughs> Sorry. 
over here in the Netherlands, everybody has a cold or the flu or some people are going for a second or a third round of COVID. I am, I think I am one of the only people I know who hasn't had COVID yet. So it's not like I want to have it, but I did my 30th COVID test last weekend because we were seeing friends. And I was feeling a little bit, you know, I had symptoms. So I thought I'm going to just be a good girl and do another test. It was negative again. Yay. So they're doing tests right now about people who may be, well, immune or resistant. And they're looking for people who've never had it, even though people in their direct vicinity did have it. So I am kind of wondering if I should report myself and say, okay. So maybe I was just lucky, you know, that's what you feel. It's like, it doesn't have to be that you, that I, am immune to it at all. So I'm inking right now and I'm going to go over that with watercolor in a minute. Or a minute, <laughs> a couple of minutes. So I'm not I'm, I'm I'm quite happy with how it comes across on video. Um, on my own tablet, I can see that the lines are very well visible here for you. So Okay, so now there is, so I inked the most important line. So I'm thinking maybe I'm going to do some blossom here. I'm going to um, ink the um, leaves with the, um, with the tiny micron. And then I have to erase. Hmm. So I'm going to do a little test. Because I know I can erase the pencil lines, but I'm not sure how long it takes before I can use an eraser on top of the microns, of these red microns. If they look anything like the black ones, then I won't have to wait too long. Sometimes I use um, a hair dryer to speed up the drying process. Can you hear the noise outside? It's a, a bunch of jackdaws flying into town every morning. And they they sit in the same chestnut tree that um, the woodpecker sits in that I drew here in my in my drawing. I really love the jackdaws. We feed them. So sometimes when I record videos you can hear them screaming because they'll be sitting in my garden waiting for food <laughs> okay i'm i'm gonna try and not yeah i'm gonna try and not make it a special pencil sketch with ink 
Um, so I'm just gonna draw in some blossom. I'm gonna go over that with ink in a minute. I felt that um, there, th this painting is it's so funny. I showed my my daughters yesterday, my husband, and they each saw something different in them. One felt it was um, a sad painting, the other felt it was comforting painting, and um, yeah, it's always funny how people look at your work. And then for me, there is a lot in this drawing, which really is about our connection with nature and um, how, and also consolation I find in it as a human being. It can be so simple, you know. Sometimes I have a, you know, if you have a rough day, or if I have a rough day and I look outside my studio or suddenly hear the laughter of the green woodpecker, it can just make me so happy. It's like my friends come back, you know? And of course, there is no real friendship in that sense, but it still feels so good. Oh God, I am making this so difficult for myself. I only just realized. <laughs> uh oh. Because I'm going to watercolor this thing. And with all this detailing going on, it's going to be excruciating to, to add watercolor and not cross the lines. Hmm. Okay, well. This is what I started, so I'm going to finish it. <laughs> I'm not going to work with masking fluid. I don't like masking fluid that much. And um, it, it often damages the paper a bit or some, some masking fluids. They color the paper or... Um, and they ruin my brushes. So I do use very cheap designated brushes for it, but... I haven't found my way with masking fluid, I have to say. I think I tried nearly every brand and um not really not really my thing oh <laughs> do you startle when the points when the tips of your pencils break So I'm just making very, very loose flowers. I might as well have done them in one go with ink because I'm drawing them so loosely, but oh, they broke again. But hey. Um, yeah, I think I'm done. So I'm going to ink these very little details and have a sip of tea first. 
Is there some kind of wax color pencil that will make watercolor paint stay in lines? You know, I was thinking about that yesterday and I tried it out, but with um, color pencils, um, I find the trouble is that um, they don't really make, you know, they don't really fill out the tooth of the paper enough for that to happen. So um, wax will resist water, of course, but in my experience, it won't do it enough to, um, I think you would have to use wax crayons for that. And that would not work with um, the amount of detail in this um, drawing, for instance. It would be a nice idea, although then you would be stuck with um, with wax pencil on your paper. But you know, it's it's also um, when you're using watercolor. Um, one of the oh god, and now I'm saying something that I don't always I don't always practice it. I preach it a lot <laughs> when I teach. Um, I always say you know watercolor is a medium that um, is not all about perfection. Um, Sometimes the charm of watercolor is in um, the fact that you can see lines, markings, puddles. You can see that the watercolor misbehaved. And so if you're like me, I have a tendency to want to have... Um, How shall I say it? If I paint a surface with watercolor, I want the surface to be um, pristine. Like I don't want there to be any lines or um, no flowering, no hard lines. But that really is just nonsense. <laughs> So at the top of this paper, I tried out, um, you know, erasing color pencils. I found out about these erasable color pencils a couple of weeks ago. Um, I didn't even know there was such a thing. And then I found out and I, I was already thinking about doing, you know, trying a painting with red ink. And then I realized that having erasable color pencils would be so great when you're working with a different color of ink than black because um once you go over pencil with ink and the ink is usually transparent you will see you know when you start erasing sometimes the ink and the paint they lock up the um the graphite particles in the paper beneath the ink and when that happens, um, you will always see the graphite shine through. And I really don't like that. So I figured I really want to try out these color pencils. And I bought them. And I also tried out um, the color pencils here at the top. Um, and, you know, some of them erase pretty well. But, you know, better than I expected, but not really good. You know, so you will always see um, a, a lot of residue or, um, and I really wanted to make my sketch in um, color pencil rather than do it in graphite. 
of course you can always you know um make a sketch put it on a light pad and trace it with red ink that was also an option and i might try that but at the same time i really like the process of building up a drawing you know with a sketch it sort of um allows me to um to really embark on that project I don't know if you understand what I mean, but part of the fun and charm is, you know, the the imperfect state or stage, I mean, where it's still, you know, when you go from having a vague idea to to having, you know, a piece. And I really like how in a sketch and in a drawing that builds up how that process is reflected. So. Whenever I, um, I do use the light box a lot, but um, I use it mostly for very, very graphic work for my ink work. What are you guys doing? Are you watching me or are you listening and you're just drawing yourselves or are you having a coffee trying to wake up or are you having a coke and, and before going to bed or staying awake? I sometimes watch lives and then um, when I do very early in the morning, um, I sort of um, clear out my the mess on my worktop and you know, sometimes join the conversation and, um, or I, I, or I watch while I'm cooking or, and so I'm sort of half listening, half watching. And sometimes, um, I listen when, um, when I'm drawing or painting. Okay. So I think I had them all. Yeah. Okay. So some final leaves I love drawing and painting detail. Sometimes people ask me how I can be so patient. Um, and the funny thing is I am not patient at all anywhere else in my life. <laughs> but I am patient when it comes to making work. I don't know how that is. I think it's just very relaxing to to draw a lot of detail and very often I find that it really helps. Sometimes the detail makes the picture, you know, not always, but sometimes it does. So I think the inking part is done. And what I'm really, really glad about is that I left open these branches here at the bottom. Mm, now I got to find myself. Where's my eraser? Because I like how... Yeah. The pencil erases really well. Um, so I am going to give this um, a minute to dry. Because... Um, and I wonder how the ink dries on top of this erasable pencil. I don't even know what this, um, I think it's an oil based pencil, but I'm not sure. It doesn't say, it doesn't say you can write your name on this. <laughs> That's funny. These are actually children's pencils, by the way. 
so they're not expensive. But I'm going to give this a little bit of time. Does anybody have a question for me to answer in the meantime? Because I want to give this a little bit of time before I start going over this with my eraser. and Because I don't want to smudge anything. There is anybody who wants to know something. I can show you the, the watercolor set that I'm going to use. I've already picked my colors. So today I'll be using, of course, the Cobalt Turquoise P250. Um, I will be using, I am doubting still whether I'm going to use a cobalt blue or phthalo blue red shade. I'm going to use, um, a German green umber for very light branches. I'm going to use some Van Dyke brown here and there. And a little bit of green for the woodpecker and the leaves. And I think I'm going to use quick and necrodome coral. And then for um, the for the um, the flowers, the blossoms, and then I want to use a really I think the um, perylene red for um, the woodpeckers. Um, I would say hair. It's not really hair, right? So that's what I'm gonna um, use in this drawing. And then I'm really curious what that'll do, how what it will look like with. Um, um red ink because i um it made a little test here where i um you know tried out what it looks like in comparison with red or with black ink and it really is substantially different so well i'm just gonna see what it does Composing, you're, Anya, you're composing some engraving designs with one eye and watching with the other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I, I find that for me, that's the best way to watch um, a lot of YouTube videos, especially when they're a bit longer. Um, I like it's sort of, um, I don't know, it's like having company when you're working. <laughs> And I'm finding it harder these these days to find really nice videos on YouTube. Um, for some reason, YouTube have changed the algorithm, I find, of, you know, the videos they think you should watch. And I'm getting so many videos recommended that I really wonder, where did you get that idea from? That I was going to like that. Um, so I've been having trouble lately finding really good videos and... Um, because, you know, the people that I follow um, are people who used to make a lot of content. But, you know, after a while, people have to sort sort what well, they don't have to find out, but they find out along the line whether they are content creators or artists. And, um, you know, creating content is just really, really time consuming, labor intensive. And it's something you've got to want to do. you got to like that. And um, it's something I had to figure out at one point, too. There were so many people asking me to do more reviews and make more content about the paints. But the thing is, you know, I am not a content creator. If that is going to be the only thing I do or if that's going to leave me very little time to make my work, it makes me unhappy and stressed and... And I have seen that many of the people that I follow on YouTube have been going through the same thing, you know, going through one burnout after another in the process of finding out what they are or who they are, what they want to do, what their limitations are, how much energy they have to invest, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it's a very good process, very natural process, but it does mean that, you know, I used to have like this sort of <laughs> schedule of watching YouTube videos and um, if you're wondering why I am you know um, putting down my arm or my fist in a on a paper rather than my hand is because you know my hand will be greasy so I am it looks a bit clumsy when I hold my paper down with my fist but that's why I don't want to grease my paper so but anyway I used to have sort of this routine this YouTube video routine um, you know, of people that I follow that I would watch uh, because they made videos very regularly. But most of them have um, have now 
um, retreated or um, stopped altogether. There are quite a few people who stopped making videos. And um, so I'm sort of like looking for new content. Um, I'm finding it hard. YouTube is not exactly cooperating. Um, and I also don't have a feeling they are very interested in how the changes in their algorithms are affecting the user. So I don't know if if, if anybody else recognizes um, the the changed timelines. I have found that um, I am not sure if this is true. Maybe this is not news anymore. Maybe you feel like, oh my God, you've been hiding under, you've been living under the pavement for years because this is, you know, that this has been a reality for a long time. But I find now these days, it feels like my YouTube timeline is no longer based on my search habits and my watching habits on YouTube, but that it's based on my, um, on search keywords that I enter in, in Google and everything and, and my other internet behavior. And, you know, that becomes really annoying when, for example, you've been spending a couple of days in your, in your Christmas break with somebody else looking up things for them that you're not interesting, interested in, but you're trying to help somebody else out. And suddenly my YouTube timeline is flooded with topics that I don't care about. <laughs> Makes me kind of uh, gnarly. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try something out here before I um, before I um, add color to the painting. So I am deliberating whether I'm going to um, leave out the tree when I'm painting or whether I'm going to paint the tree blue along with the sky and then go over it with another color. I'm going to make a little bit of noise. Mm, just a moment. to dry that one up before I moved on. Um, now, um, I was going to use this color. So this is Van Dyke Brown. This is Van Dyke Brown on its own and Van Dyke Brown with the blue underneath. Hmm. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Hmm. I think I'm just going to... I think I'm going to, hmm. yes, I'm going to do the whole thing blue. Yeah. Okay. Made up my mind. And he says, did you ever try goat brushes with watercolor? Goat brushes. Some artists like calligraphic goats very much. No, I haven't tried goat brushes. Is that the Chinese brushes? I do have some Chinese brushes um, that have very sturdy hair. Um, and they are for, calli for calligraphy. But I haven't tried. No, no. Lee Art is sitting painting and long videos from other artists. So when I look forward, they are harder to find now. So yes, something has changed. Yeah, YouTube is really pushing shorts. I don't know if anybody here um, makes um, videos, but YouTube has been nudging me um, quite a few times 
about making shorts and I don't want shorts. I'm not about shorts. You know, there are, if I want to do shorts, I'll do reels and tick. I don't do TikTok by the way, but if I wanted to do that, that's where I'd be. But I don't want to do that. You know, I am, I am a wordy person. I choose techniques, art techniques that take time that are very time and energy consuming. So doing shorts is just not my thing. But YouTube is, um, I need a little more water. But YouTube is very adamant about, you know, doing shorts. And also, um, I've noticed that um, I am getting presented with a lot of shorts. And I found out that on my computer, I can take away the entire um, beam <laughs> you know, that presents the shorts, um, which I do. I always click like, uh, you know, remove this beam because I am really, oh, look, I've already put down my hand too much. This paper has become greasy. Ah, uh, yikes. That's not what I wanted. Oh, I was going to go over that tree. Oh, uh, or not. Hmm. Because I don't want to go over the... The br I don't want to go over the roots. Maybe I'm not going <laughs> over the wood. Oh, this paper. By the way, this is also a new kind of watercolor paper that I'm using for the first time. It's by Canson and it's um, cheaper. Um, it's a four size that I wanted to try, but... I don't know if it's the paper or that I've already touched it too much with my hand, but it's very, very greasy. It's resisting my watery, um, very watered down watercolor. But, you know, talking about YouTube, I am, even though I keep clicking on, you know, remove the shorts, be, remove the shorts from my timeline, it keeps presenting them back and now it's no longer presenting the shorts um, separately, but it's integrating the shorts in, you know, in the search results. And I'm like, haven't you, have you still not figured out that I am, I don't, I'm not really interested in shorts <laughs> and I'm beginning to get annoyed. And, and, you know, I had this habit of when I was in bed, I would look up a couple of videos before going to bed, before sleeping. And recent, in the past months, I've spent more time looking for videos than I have watching them. And that is because it was just really hard to find anything that I like because YouTube is not presenting me with those things. Um, because it's presenting things to me that I don't want to see. Um, so I've been, you know, turning off YouTube more and more often, you know, not watching a video before I go to sleep anymore. Um, and I'm wondering, where are the creators that I love? Have they all gone? Have they all moved? And I think that YouTube has, be has really begun to treat us much in the same way that Facebook and Instagram have, you know, they want content from us. Um... And, you know, any content, especially when it's commercially interesting so they can push um, videos, uh, sorry, ads. And um, the behavior is changing towards the users and the creators. And I'm not liking it very much. At the moment, there are not really alternatives, but I can imagine that, you know, if there, when there is a good alternative, just like with Mastodon now for Twitter, that some people are going to move away. I've, I've seen so many artists um, talk about this um, on other channels too, how they are sad that, you know, YouTube is changing so much and how they, you know, if you're an artist and you're serious about your work, um, and about making new work, it's very hard to constantly be making content all the time. Especially when you start noticing that you're, the content you want to make no longer gets views or... It's very demotivating. I 
I like what this um, light blue does with the red ink. I love the contrast. This paper, by the way, takes an awful lot of time before the color sets. So as, as the color sets, the color becomes darker. This is a weird paper. I usually work with um, Canson Monval. That's the cheapest watercolor paper I normally use. And I actually bought this pad to make um, color charts on because the size of the paper, it fits so nicely into my folders. I have to get used to this. <laughs> it, to me, this paper feels more like mixed media paper than um, watercolor paper, to be honest. Um, I'll show you in a minute what this um, paper is. Show you the front of the of the block. I can tell it can take quite a bit of paper, but it behaves so differently from the paper I'm used to working with. I like working with hundred percent cotton paper and with the cancel monval. Okay, so. giving this a second to dry. This is Canson XL watercolor paper, fine grain cold pressed, heavy weight. And well, this definitely does not contain any, um, any cotton. So if you're interested, this, what this I think will also make a really good mixed media paper. You're free to get, any are you afraid, uh, afraid of greasing paper or smearing? I've put a napkin on them. Yeah, I know. I do that a lot too. I just didn't do that now. <laughs> I have a whole pile of um, really smooth paper that I use for that purpose. So um, I just don't always do that. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to do a very, um, what I think is going to be a difficult job. But now I have to choose, and I think I'm going to do cobalt blue because I'm going to paint around the leaves and the, the flowers and everything. And, um, well, I, I don't think I can do the entire process of this painting in this live um, because when working with watercolor, I, I layer a lot and... Um, You know, when the first layers are done, I always add more. So, okay, I'm going to gonna use this color. And I have a Daler Rowney graduate pencil. I've never used it for fine details, so let's see if it works. It does hold quite a bit of water, which is a good thing. Uh oh um i've left a little bit of um color pencil here so i thought that the ink was starting to bloom but it isn't fortunately it's the color pencil so no problem <laughs> that is a really bad thing you know i once bought this beautiful drawing ink and people were so enthusiastic about it waterproof and everything and then, you know, I had spent hours inking a big drawing. And the moment I lay down watercolor on it, oh God, the whole thing began to, the ink began to resolve and was dreadful. So these days, <laughs> when I want to buy something, first thing I try to do, and sometimes it works, is I try to find somebody who already owns the stuff and I try it out first. If I really, if I need something that's guaranteed waterproof, I sometimes try it out first with somebody else. 
And waterproof is a thing when you're working with watercolor, especially when you're doing a lot of layers. So there are also inks that when you lay down the first layer, no problem, it's waterproof. But then, um, because the paper gets really, um, when you add water, the paper gets um, a little more um, absorbing. Um, sometimes with the second layer of paint, you will see that ink starts to dissolve or the lines are no longer crisp or so, yeah. It can be really, a ch it can be a challenge to find the right ink. And I like working with India ink, with the Winter Newton Black India ink, the one with the spider on the front. I think that for me, that is the, so thus far, it's the best ink that I tried. And it's really waterproof and, uh, oh, this is going to, this, I really don't like painting around such small, look, I've already, already accidentally hit a flower with the glue oh well here is where i always tell you know my students you know don't, you don't have to be too precise with watercolor <laughs> happy mistakes are lovely but here is where i don't always practice what i preach I already noticed that this paper is trying to buckle here on this side. I feel it's coming up. It's hmm. I think that sometimes is the hard part when you're used to working with really great stuff, especially paper. Um, when you go back to using, you know, more affordable art supplies sometimes you just not it doesn't do it for you at least that's my in my experience i don't know if you guys experience the same but it took me a long time to move from you know the canson monval to um to 100 percent cotton paper I spent years doing that because I, I couldn't justify, you know, getting just a few sheets for that much money. But the problem is when you suddenly <laughs> realize the importance of it and when you get used to how it works. Um, going back to other more affordable options is sometimes no longer really an option anymore. So this was a tryout. This is, you know, a little something I'm doing to test some materials with my style and to see what it does for me. So I figured let's give it a try and let's get to know the paper. This is where it might be quicker <laughs> to use masking fluid. But my experience with masking fluid aren't too great, so.
Hello, Paolo. Do I pronounce your name correctly, Paolo? Good morning, or at least it's morning here. I'm working on the first layer of watercolor and I got to see how it works out. You know, um, when the first layer is on, I got to see how I want to, I probably will continue <laughs> adding more layers. But I won't all I won't be doing that all in the live because um, you know drawing like this can take me up to about four hours, I think. Um, all in all, with um, you know just a coloring. So that would be a very very long live. That would probably get a little bit boring. <laughs> Good morning. And yes, you did pronounce it correctly. Ah, <laughs> great. <laughs> I've been in a lot of international online groups in the past years. So um, we're people from South America, the States, um, Africa. So, um, in Europe, of course. Um, so you learn, you learn a little bit about how people say things. Okay. Oh, I'm I'm nearly forgetting the arm. I do try to paint loosely, you know, I do try to paint. I recommend my students to paint. <laughs> I'm always, for myself, I'm always quite adamant about precision. Last week, no, um, two weeks ago, I spent four, no, f three work days, three full work days on, um, on an ink drawing that I did. It wasn't even that big, A3 size, but um, I was fretting all the time about making it perfect. Ink is so, ink can be so unforgiving, right? Okay, so now let's see. Um, I'm going to go for German Green Umber, which is not a really pretty color in itself, but I like how it looks next to different kinds of blue. What I also like about green umber is how it um, can be such a good replacement of, can be such a good alternative to Titan Buff, but then um, a more transparent variety version of it. This is very light. Hmm. I wanted to keep it very light this time. I'll do it a little bit more dark. I have a tendency to lay down a lot of color at once. And, you know, most times it's good. It's the way I work. But sometimes I'm like, oh, God, no, that's way, way, way too much.
there is some tender beauty in especially light watch, watches like these and it's soothing to look at the process yeah it definitely is and i think that you know with the red ink it really does well maybe not require but i think it allows lighter washes i think the black is so commanding in a way which i love by the way i like working in high contrast so that's never really you know it's never been an issue um So I want to use the same color in the, you know, for the, for the branches going up here. Um, is it dry enough? I'm going to make a little bit of noise. I just want to be sure. So I, I use a heat gun for that purpose. So I'm going to make a little bit of noise, just a few seconds. Oh, this is so light for my liking. <laughs> okay, yeah, well. <laughs> the reason, by the way, I don't know if you guys, when you, if you work with um, watercolor a lot, but if your paper starts buckling when you use a heat gun, um, try um, applying the heat gun to the back side of the paper as well. I don't know if you learned, if you've already tried out that trick or figured it out for yourself, but that really helps sometimes. Not with all paper, but most times it does. So I always also use it on the back. Hello, Lulu. <laughs> You also apply the heat gun to the back of the paper. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know what um, what replies are there, um, what is reply to, because I found out this morning that there is a huge lag between the um, live recording and between the recording and between the broadcasting. And it's the lag is a lot bigger than it used to be. I'm used to it being a couple of seconds, but now it's almost half a minute. So, um, I think that may be confusing sometimes in the chat, you know, when, um, when I think you're applying to one thing and that maybe it's the, it's something totally different. <laughs> I hope it's visible for you. I can only see my, my own um, screen is very small. It's on my tablet. And then the chat is open as well. So it's only a very small um, piece I can see. I hope you have a better view of my work than I do myself. <laughs> <coughs> I'm going to have a little bit of tea. Oh, using contrast. Yeah. Yeah, I always use a lot of contrast. There are so many people who tell me, and I find that really funny sometimes, people who say, you use watercolor wrong. <laughs> and I didn't know there was a right way to use it. 
But yeah, I use watercolor completely wrong. I know, I do. Okay, so now I, um, how am I going to do this? I just want to add a little bit of pink here and there. Not too much. In the flowers. This is so not my style. <laughs> Normally, I'd be super precise about this, but hey, I was going to try something new, so. I may have to add another layer of of cobalt blue. I will add another layer of cobalt blue. I think it's a little bit too laid back. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. But, you know, and then, then the challenge is to not make that too dark all of a sudden. <laughs> so I try it out here. So... I always have um, a sheet of watercolor paper right next to me that I will try that that I will try things like this out on. So what happens if I add another layer of the already existing um, color that I have, um, rather than just going in with more with darker blue? I still want to keep it light, but I do feel that. It's too light now. There is no difference in tone at all. And mm, I think by the time this is finished, it's going to look completely different. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start painting the tree. And I'm going to use Van Dyke Brown for that job. And I am going to keep that rather light or not. <laughs> Let's see. But that's the only area of the painting that I can work on right now without touching anything that's not dry yet. So I'm just going to go in. Is this too dark? Hmm, that's maybe too dark. I think I need to add a little more water. Now it's too light. I'm going to use a bigger brush for this one. <laughs> it's going to take forever. It's another thing people always tell me. You work with two small brushes. I know. <laughs> I think it has a lot to do with the fact that I... Um, that for me, painting with watercolor is a very meditative process. And I taught myself to work with very small brushes, lots of detail. And um, it's how I do it. Even like painting my house with very small brushes, too. <laughs> I 
I like how the red lines, um, they do something to the... to the dull colors. Another really strange habit of mine that I've been, that somebody pointed out to me, she said, you always have your um, palette on the left side of your work. I said, yeah, but my, you know, I, um, my right hand is always painting, so it's not very comfortable to have my palette. Oh, this is not good. I don't like that. It's a piece of um, paint of the brush that came off. But, you know, um, so when my right hand is here, I don't like having my palette over here. And she said, well, I'm right-handed too, but <laughs> I have my palette right there with me. I'm like, okay. No idea. Are your palettes on... So if you're right-handed, do you keep your palette on the right side or do you keep it on the left like I do? Because I actually figured that was quite a <laughs> logical thing to do. You know, we all may be in the process of making art and learning to make art. And especially maybe when you're self-taught, you develop these things that may be quirks to others. Oh no, shouldn't do that with my fingers. Oh. All of a sudden, all the lacquer comes off the brush. That's annoying. Because it's actually a really nice brush. So that's when I normally take the glue and just try to, you know, or put a varnish around it to try and hold on to the original layer of lacquer that's on the brush. There should be more arts that use watercolors the wrong way. Too many, yeah. You ain't waiting. That's why you work with acrylics and inks most. Yeah. I know I used to work with acrylics as well a lot. It's how I started out painting. But um, in the end to me, you know, I love, I still love making mixed media paintings in my living room. There are a lot of mixed media paintings that I did, but mm, I don't know. Mm. 
but both of them very much it would be great to see more individuality in watercolor art yeah there is sort of still this standard going on isn't there um i find that you know in illustration there is more acceptance towards using art materials whatever way you want but as soon as you want to go into the art world well in the first place they don't like illustration illustration is not art whereas you know good illustrators are definitely artists in my view um but also the way you know the fact that you know there is no standard to how certain art supply should be used whatever makes you tick right i mean of course when you teach watercolor you teach the possibilities and then what you hope students will do is that they move on to you know to being the nutty professor that you once were yourself and that they start experimenting and start finding ways that work for them i always find it very annoying when people start commenting on you're not using watercolor the way you should <laughs> It's also, some people say, oh, you've got a watercolor supply that's going to last you seven lifetimes. And I'm like, well, no, actually, no. I use a lot of paint. Well, this, you know, this is out of character. I'm I'm using very light washes now. Um, if you've seen previous work of mine, you will see that that's not the way I work normally. Um, oh, I'm clumsy at it, too. <laughs> okay, so I'm leaving the one branch um white and that is because i just came up with the idea that i feel i think i feel yeah i feel that this um character me her um we'll call it a dress or um a coat it needs to be um a darker tone of that same blue so i'm gonna go over that with um with another thin layer, with another wash. Um, oh God, and I added too much. I don't want to make it too dark. I do want to make. I do want to keep this a little bit lighter to let the red line show through. Lila says, on the right, you're scared to drip on art reaching over. Oh, yeah. And if you have long sleeves, what happens sometimes is that your sleeve will drag over your wet paint. That is really, really annoying. So, it, of course, it makes sense to, um, to have your palette on the side of the hand you work with. Um, <laughs> when you think about it. You use transparent. No, oh, yeah. That's a good idea, Paolo. Oh. I'm going to raid my daughter's room and see if she's got some transparent um, nail polish. That's a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> you're, you're using it wrong. Yeah, it is ridiculous, isn't it? It's like, it's like people have this, this one truth or something about something. Your palette is on the left too, and yeah, ah, that's why I'm not the only cookie. <laughs> You'll keep your palette in front of you. Okay, yeah. Well, that's an, I sometimes do that too. Um, but don't you sometimes drag your sleeves over your work then? I sometimes have that, but I, I honestly also have that when I put my palette on the left side. You know, it doesn't really, it doesn't make a big difference for me. <laughs> That's why I was probably so, you know, it took me so long to finish that um, ink drawing a little while ago. I wanted to make no mistakes. I'm going to make a little bit of noise again to um, dry up the, to dry the tree. Then I'm going to paint the, the um, well, dress or coat. Then I'm going to paint the branch and the um, woodpecker.
Okay, so there's going to be one more coat of cobalt blue. This is the core cobalt blue, by the way, and I love the core cobalt blue. You know, not doing an ad here, I'm not getting paid for this, but um, I love how this, um, I need just a tad more color. I love how um, the, the core cobalt blue, when you apply that on a wet spot, the paint shoots over the page. And I know that some watercolorists really hate um, this paint for it because it really, really tends to misbehave in that respect. There is, there is very, very little possibility for control, but I actually love that. <laughs> So in every set of paints that I compose, there will be core cobalt blue. And it's also a really beautiful um, cobalt blue in my experience. It's bright, it's not, it's, it's not dull in any sense, whereas sometimes cobalt blues tend to dry up a little bit dull and I really like the core cobalt because it doesn't. It's super expensive over here to buy the core paints here in the Netherlands. There are very, very few stores that stock them. So, you know, especially the cobalt is very expensive, but yeah. It's one of those colors I need to have in my, in my set. And the funny thing is, a little while back, I had a discussion with somebody who said, well, but when you're doing illustrations, does it matter how precise that color is? And actually, of course, it doesn't, because when you start scanning or photographing, all the um, nuance that you get with, um, you know, in the real work is gone. There are so many colors, like take, for instance, a PG-50 is one of the colors I use in well, I think in nearly every painting I do, it's classically a color that your scanner won't recognize. Um, so it would be something like trying to scan upper, upper rose or upper pink, you know, the neon one. You can try to scan it, but I doubt your, your scanner will be able to translate that color to your screen. So sometimes people confront me with these questions that make me think about the way I work. It's like, because uh, it was a, an, an, an illustrator who uses only the Van Gogh paints. And she says, why do you use the, the Rembrandts? I said, because I like working with them. But she said, you won't see it in the end result. And I thought, no, you're right. You really won't see it in the end result um, once it's digitized. So, well, Sometimes people can ask good questions that make you think. In Portugal, it's impossible to get. Is it impossible? Oh, Paulo, that's a pity. And Amazon. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptic, skeptical about Amazon, to tell you the truth, because I've been hearing a lot lately about people getting fake stuff on Amazon. And I do have to say, usually it is um, pan sets and pans. that I'm like, oh. You know, I, so I, I'm very, very scared to, um, to order on Amazon. Your paintings are usually very small, so you can, yeah, well, that's the thing with me too. Oh, talking about size. There are also so many people who go like, well, if you want to exhibit your artwork, um, you know, galleries and art fairs, they want to, they prefer to see larger work. Um, so I'm getting asked a lot, why don't you work? Can't you try and make some larger work? But the trouble is, and I always try to explain it, and people look at me with empty eyes, you know, like, duh, um, is that um, I work with pigments. And I, I, I mean to say that a lot of my work is based on the behavior of pigments. So um, 
you know, some people, they make a drawing or a sketch and they have this image in mind and the image has to come out a certain way. Um, for me, well, in this case, the one that I'm doing now, that is the case. But usually I, I start from, I don't know, let's say a very rough sketch and then I start applying pigments and I let them do something and I let that in turn inspire me. So a little while back, I was trying to please my husband who wanted to have a big watercolor on the wall in the living room because we have we now have these um, acrylic mixed media paintings on the wall and they've been there for six, seven years now. And he's like, it's time for something new. Can't you make something big? So I thought, you know what, let's give that a try. <laughs> I did a setup. Um, and it's still on my drafting table in um, the first layer because it's just not as much fun. It's my process is different. I like working um, small. And um, yeah, that's something not everybody understands. Am I going to paint? all of the of the sleeves or not thinking out loud here there's just so much you know people try to um sometimes of course you know they they mean well but i do find sometimes people are trying to give you advice on how maybe you could work or should work <laughs> Like you're using watercolor wrong, or maybe you should work bigger. Yeah, well, if you work with oils, I think you should work big. Yeah, that would be a good idea, because I think if you work small with oils, very hard to get details, etc. But, you know, when you work with watercolor, it's so, so easy to have detail in small work. Okay, so I'm liking that. Um, I'll take a look at things that you may have entered in the chat. I, I have to, <laughs> I'll do that in a minute. I have to finish this first. This paper, by the way, does work quite okay for um, what I am positively surprised about is how well it allows me to um, to pick paint back up and move it around on on the paper so the the pigments don't immediately sink into the paper that's a good thing because that allows me to yeah to make it very light in this way okay so I'm keeping it like that now I'm moving on because I am painting this part darker blue. Well, darker blue is not the right word, just another layer. And as you can see, I'm going over the stems of the leaves now. Didn't do that the first time. I'm doing that now because when I color the leaves, they will be a bright kind of green. And um, I want the stems to be darker. So that's why I'm now... Just going over them with the cobalt blue. Some people use really big brushes for this kind of work as well. I don't. <laughs> I am a bit clumsy with big brushes. So if I did use big brushes now, um, I think it would be, uh, the paint would be all over the place, although, although it already is. So I am definitely now practicing what I always preach. I'm trying to not be too precise, <laughs> but um, I'm not sure how I'm liking that. My inner perfectionist is beginning to roar that I am making mistakes, so, well.
Okay. Now, what do I do? Let's see, where are we? Now we feel like we'll just stay in flow, especially with those pieces. Mm -hmm. Look alike. Lula, you say, you love my strong ability to stay in the flow, especially the face pieces. I work this way in acrylics, but with watercolor, it's tricky. Because of transparency and pigments. Look alike in a pen. Yes, they do. They do. It takes a lot of, um, it takes a lot of trying. Trying, trying, trying. Like, like, um, you have to really, really, really get to know your paints. So what can work if I don't know how many colors you have, but what can work for you then is to limit the, the amount of colors you work with so that you get to know them really, really well and then um, build up on that slowly. That's something because when you work with acrylics, it's, it's just such a different way of working. And um, you can always go back in and, and make corrections, which you cannot with watercolor without... Um, affecting the watercolor look of your painting um, some people go back in with gouache or they will scratch away things but that's going to damage the surface of your paper etc um, and I think when you when I when I read you saying it knocks you out of flow um, that often has a lot to do with control with you know um, with acrylics you have full control um, and the moment you start working with watercolor, what many people, um, what many artists dislike about watercolor is that they lose control. And um, that's something that, um, well, it sounds really strange. You have to live with. It's something you can learn to enjoy. And it's something that actually, when you get a lot of practice, you do get control again. But, you know, it takes a lot of hours to, and, and also... When you have this one brand of paint and you think you have managed it all and then you get a new brand of paint and then, whoops, it behaves all differently. Like I just said, for instance, with a core cobalt blue, that is um, a totally different cobalt blue than any of the other brands. Not in the look of the color, although I, I feel it's a little bit bright, a little bit brighter than the other brands, uh, but in how it behaves. Um, but the fun part for me is, you know, I always feel like a nutty professor. So when I get a new paint, I will start experimenting with it in the widest sense of the word. And um, at some point, you really know what your paint is going to do. And you know what your paint is going to do in combination with other pigments, with other materials. And then, or sometimes you don't actually know, but you suspect because you get to know it really well. Um, and that can be a really fun process to... Um, to do so I always have my um I call them my lab hours which is like okay so I'm just gonna sit down and play and then I have my painting hours so the painting part is when I know what I'm doing sort of and then the lab hours is where I'm I have no clue and I will I will combine the paints with all kinds of materials and stuff so um so Lee Art says, if I want to do a bigger work, I'll go for pastels. Watercolors are more like a meditation to me. Pa pastels are action. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Oh, God, pastels. Is me, I've got a love-hate relationship with pastels. I love how it looks, and I think I would love to do it. But I, I, I get goosebumps all over the moment that I touch pastel, even with the pan pastels. I sit there having goosebumps from my big toe up until the tip of my head. And it <laughs> feels very uncomfortable to work with them. And last year, I give myself uh, an art supply gift for Christmas every year. And last year, 
I ironically gave myself the present of the full collection of Conte Square hard pastel crayons. <laughs> they are about the worst thing to work with for my goosebump defect. <laughs> So I've always been meaning to work with pastels, but um, so far I did not have the courage to face my goosebump thing. <laughs> I do sometimes use it on um, watercolor though. I have a couple of sets of um, pastel pencils and I use them on top. And that's, um, that's, you know, apart from the goosebumps, that looks very nice because you can, you can make these beautiful color gradations and um, I think that's really, really nice. Pastels are action. What kind of paper do you use for your pastels? Do you use, um, I have, I tried velour paper. Um, I tried um, the gritty stuff, the sandy paper, pastel matte. Um, I tried watercolor, but watercolor was horrible because um, the pasta would fall right off. So I found it really, really hard. I'm an inspiration for you. Oh, okay, that's really nice to hear. Thank you so much. That's why you need to do more experimenting in lab time. Yes, definitely. Watercolor, I can, you know, I think watercolor is the hardest um no, no, there is one, there is one medium that's even hard, that's a lot harder than watercolor, at least to me, it's gouache. I find gouache very difficult to work with, but I have to say that I mean gouache as in, um, I don't know if you know the work of Rebecca Dautremer, she is a French illustrator, and she is, she makes such wonderful work, and she works with gouache only, that's the way I'd love to work. She can use it like watercolor and then use it, you know, more opaquely and it's gorgeous. But that's, you know, I haven't managed that yet. It's very difficult. But other than that, I think watercolor is um, what most people find most difficult to work with. So if you find it difficult, you know, it's okay. It, it's, it's okay. And it also depends on whether you use artist great watercolor or student grade because um student grade watercolor is um a lot easier to work with and when you're starting out and you you find you're having trouble with um with watercolor then it may be a good idea to try student grade first um because when you start out with you know, I do these raving, enthusiastic reviews about art, qual artist quality watercolor. And of course, they are really great and there's a lot of pigment in them. But when you're starting out with watercolor or when you're having trouble, um, you know, getting adjusted to them or learning them, then um, I think student grade is a lot better to work with because um, it behaves in a more all the colors, most colors, behave roughly the same. So there is no adjusting to the pigment. So then maybe you can buy, you know, a few colors that you cannot get in um, in student grade. Um, you can try, you can buy those in artist grade. Like for example, PG50, which is the cobalt blue I use for this guy. You know, there is no student grade that sells PG50. But if you really like that color, you can always um, get that, you know, an artist grade. Um, but it is a granulating pigment. So you're going to have to experiment a lot to work with that granulation, to work with the granulation. Because that's what, what's with watercolor. You cannot make it do for you what you want. So it's like having a teenager in the house, you know. Sometimes, it's, you know, they're really nice and everything. But sometimes you just have to learn to work with them because sometimes you can't force them to do things the way you want them to. That's why you got to look at watercolors. You got to be very gentle with them because they grow into beautiful things. But in order to get there, first, they can be a bit obnoxious and have a mind of their own, sort of. Even talking about goose pas even talking about pastel makes goosebumps. 
Oh, yes. Do you remember? I don't know what it, what it's like for you guys in the world, but here in the Netherlands, we had, you know, the school board, the um, when the teacher writes on, on a board, they did that with a chalk. And then every time they did that, I had goosebumps, you know, so bad that it almost hurt. Or when uh, my classmates came into a room and they put their nails on the board and they say, scratch them downwards. Oh, it was a horrible feeling. And that's what it feels like for me to work with pastels. <laughs> yeah, gouache is seriously difficult. Your mom works with gouache. It's opposite to watercolor and it, the combo is crazy hard. You know, you can use watercolors as base layer paints and then um, lie down or lay down gouache on top. And it's really, really difficult to balance all of that out. Yeah, definitely. Pastel mat and Sennelier pastel card. Pastel mat if you want details and pastel card for more expressive works. Okay, I, I never heard of, um, of pastel card. More expressive work. Yeah, I kind of like expressive work in pastel, I think. Um, I have always found it very hard. When I did try pastel, I find it very hard to, to make details. You love experimenting timeless. Yes. Experimenting time, I think, sometimes is the best. <laughs> pastel scratching is worse than a fork on a plate. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that is it. That's exactly the feeling that I have when I when I paint. It's like, oh, and I think it's so beautiful. You know, it's not that, you know, I would really like to. In fact, this Christmas, I've been pondering, um, you know, I'm a good customer with um, a local art supply store and they had this really, really magnificent um, offer for the entire collection of um, pan pastel um, for not even half the price that it normally costs. And I was so tempted to buy that <laughs> because I have great ideas of things that I could do one day with pastel. Well, I ended up not buying them because I felt, you know, if I buy something like that, I should sort of know what to do with it. And I should sort of... Um, be willing to deal with the goosebump thing and um so i thought you know i after i've been out of um if not i haven't been working a lot in the past years due to health problems and i have found that there is some residue in the sense that i i have trouble focusing for a long time on my work um, so I figured let's first get that back in shape so that I can, um, you know, fully focus on my work again. And then when I do, and when I feel up to it, then maybe I can try new, a new medium for real, seriously. Like, yeah. Yeah. And then my, my daughter said, rightfully so, why should you buy an entire collection of colors? <laughs> And she is absolutely right, but I'm always kind of inspired by having full collections of colors, which is absolutely ridiculous, but yeah. Paolo says, gouache gives you PTSD school years. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, the school gouache. Did you have these big E. Cola bottles of gouache? We had them. They were horrible. I resented gouache with a vengeance. I really did. So now I'm just working a little bit of paint in here. So this is the layering, right? You, um, it's another thing about watercolor. Um, what many people, um, are surprised when they start out with watercolor is that watercolor is all about layering and you know not just a little bit of it but a lot of it um some of the paintings that i do actually have about 70 layers of paint in them people sometimes find that hard to believe um but it's true um 
you keep going back in and um, it's um it's the way I work. I know there are a lot of people who do not work this way, and I'm not saying this is the way to work, <laughs> but um, it definitely helps when you have trouble working with watercolor to realize that, you know, your first layer is not the final product. There is a lot more um, to do than that first layer. So the first layer is just um, a base thing. And now I'm also layering with very, very thin wash. Um, I normally don't do that. I normally sometimes go in with darker colors. So what I want to do now is I want to emphasize, put more emphasis on this figure. And in order to do that, I need to start darkening this thing here, the tree, to outline her more. And I am going back in for some... going to go back in with a little bit darker color. It's like, you know, when you work with um, acrylics, if that's what you're used to, then, you know, you make a painting and then at one point you're done. So um, it's acrylics can be a very quick medium to work with. Um, with watercolors can be a very quick medium, depending on the style you have. If you work with classic, um, classic watercolors, then it can be a very quick medium. But if you use it the way I do, it's not. It's very, very time consuming. Uh oh. I added too much paint there. So I'm, I'm. I really thought that this time I would be able to finish quite a bit of it, but I'm already seeing that's not true. There's so much more I want to do about this before it looks the way I want it to look. But what I got from this was a really lovely moment um, doing a live because I find it really um, nice, you know, to um, to have a chat in the studio um, and also, you know, to experiment with um, with the red lines. It, it, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it really does. Um, it does make. A difference it has an impact I like having tried that one out you had some of a local manufacturer and not going to touch gouache ever again <laughs> yeah I know the feeling I, I there was this time when I was absolutely determined to learn to um, work with gouache the way Rebecca Dautremer does and, um, you know, I'd already taught myself so much. So I figured, you know, if I can teach myself this and that, I can also do that. <laughs> I was wrong. I really was wrong. Um, I still haven't learned to um, master um, gouache the way she does it. It's very frustrating, but yeah. Sometimes you have to admit defeat or, or sometimes, you know, um, that's also a thing. We don't need to be able to do it all. You know, if watercolor is not your thing, if that you can find out along the line, maybe watercolor is not your thing. Nothing wrong with that. It can, it can happen. 
it's okay. It doesn't have to be. So I think there are great artists who do a really great job at oils or acrylics, for instance. We don't all have to do watercolor. Um, it's already 11 o'clock, so I think I'm going to... I can't possibly finish this um, painting within... I'll, I'll, I'll try and work a little bit more on the... On the woodpecker my friend um, but I can't finish the the painting in a live session it's um I have underestimated how I still want it to have my own process you know in spite of the red inks <laughs> you're welcome you're very welcome I really really enjoyed um doing this and um you know it's um for me it's a great opportunity to um to get to talk with other people who like art and um you know to have a little chat I really really enjoy that um Sometimes it can be very quiet in the studio and sometimes it's really nice to have a really quiet studio and sometimes like, nah, it can be really great to have a little chat occasionally. So. <laughs> Not a very realistic woodpecker, but hey. <laughs> So I might do another live session, not too long from now, because um, I acquired a little set of um, Winter and Newton watercolor paints that I still have to try. And I thought I, was, I could do that in a live session. Maybe that would be nice. Sometimes people like to see swatches and everything, and um, maybe that would be a good idea. Nope. Let's see. Very, very, very light. No, this is not finished yet. It needs a lot more work. So what I'll do is I'll finish this one and then I'll upload it to my YouTube um, community where you can also post images so you can see how I finished this. And I will also upload a photo of the stage where it's at now and where it's at when I work into it more. Um, how I'm going to work into it is for sure with a little more watercolor because I'm seeing areas I want to add more paint to, especially the tree. And then what I really love doing sometimes is adding some color pencil. Although I have to see how it um, how it's going to affect the... Um, I don't want to mess up the red line, so I might just finish this in watercolor. Anya says, do you leave the hugging branch untouched intentionally? Um, yes, for now, because I was, um, I am deliberating whether I, I think I'm going to make the branches inside the coat darker. And um, I was deliberating whether I was going to give her another layer of cobalt blue. Um, and as long as I am working on that, I didn't want to touch the branch um, but that the branch will definitely be the same color. And um, I think that the tree is going to be a whole lot darker by the time it's finished as it's 
um, right now everything is really really light and there is no um, tonal no no tonal value differences in there and I think it should um, change um, and I think the branch well as soon as I think the the female figure is okay I'm going to um, finish the branch and finish it in the exact same way as a tree only then with a little bit more light um, reflecting on it the tree is going to be sort of like a backdrop more more of a shadow I think so that's what I'm going to do and I'm going to let you guys know and um, I'll be I bought this set of um, Winter Newton watercolor recently it's 18 pans so it's a small set so not a full set this time and um, I'm just going to try it out because it's the only brand that I've never tried the pans out of. So I wanted to um, give that a go just for my own curiosity. And to be very honest with you, I've been able to buy this from someone who had been gifted a double set and she sold it to me for a very, very good price. So that's why I thought, hey, let's just do that. So I'll be doing that um, soon. and. Um, there are a couple of other experiments that I wanted to do and maybe, maybe maybe I can do a lab experiment moment sometime. I don't know how you guys feel about that, but I was going to try and experiment with um, pan pastel and watercolor someday. So if I can face the goosebumps, I might do that live someday because it could be fun to just see what happens. So um, I'm not finished. I hope you liked it anyway and um, if I go back live I will let you guys know in the community so um, and I think if I'm correct if you hit a bell somewhere on my <laughs> channel that you will be notified the moment I go live online so that you will not miss it if you like to watch it and I can also try out different times because now I started in the morning but maybe I can do um, another time as well live experiments sounds good <laughs> yeah why not it's great fun too it's it's the part that I enjoy a lot because there is absolutely no pressure and it's just play and it's just fun so mm. thank you guys so much for being here and um I hope to see you back soon bye bye <laughs> now I have to end the live. <laughs>